Okay, then I think we should start. Okay, yeah, welcome to all the students that are attending today. It's a real pleasure for me to welcome you here because this is a very specific course, very special course. First, it's the first time that we have a course not only for our students from Brunswick University, but also for many students from many countries of the world. Uh, this is due to some COVID regulations, which in this case were positive, so that students from other countries could register at Würzburg University without any costs. And so we have about 60 students who have registered so far, and uh, they're coming from many, many countries. And I think this will be very much uh, a contribution for also for, for our students here, that they're not only the German students, but we have students from all over the world. And I hope when we discuss economic topics, that this will enrich uh, our debates. And so I'm very happy to have this very special course, Würzburg students plus global students. Um, and it's also a special course uh, in a second regard, because this is the first time that I give this course. I've held many courses on economics and market economics, but this is a special one uh, where I try to present macroeconomics in a kind of new perspective in the hope that you will gain a very good understanding of macroeconomic theories, macroeconomic policies, and macroeconomic debates. Before I start, uh, we have some technical things that you, you must observe. So this lecture will be recorded. This is a good thing for you because if you are not able to attend uh, the course online, then you can, of course, uh, watch it later on, so it's recorded and it's available to you. Um, and uh, we will use probably these videos for future purposes. Um, if you send messages via chat or question answers, then they will be presented without mentioning names. And uh, if you take part the audio or video, which we very much encourage, um, then we implicitly agree that you, your presentation, that uh, what you say and uh, that your picture uh, will be presented. And I very much encourage you uh, to participate via chat, via uh, also via using your camera or your video, uh, uh, because I think that's, that's helpful for all. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to use chat or, or really to, to use your video or your camera. Okay, so as I said, we have this international audience, which is something new and in my view fascinating. And for the international audience, it's maybe important to say a little bit about the location here, where we are, and the location is Würzburg. And Würzburg is geographically almost in the very south of Europe, not very far away from the location where the middle center of Europe is located. And uh, as you can see from this photo, Würzburg is really a lovely town. Uh, it's just in spring, uh, it's especially nice and attractive. Uh, you can see it's a very old town with, with a castle, with an old dome, uh, with a kind of palace. And so uh, we have the river mine, which goes through this river. And uh, you can see on the picture the fortress Marienburg, uh, which, which is a very impressive building. And you can also see this bridge, which is the uh, old, old bridge and one of the oldest bridges uh, in Europe. And uh, in times before Corona and hopefully after Corona, it's a meeting point for students, for, for visitors from all over the world, uh, drinking white wine uh, on, this, on this bridge because Würzburg is also very famous for its wines, especially for white wines. So it's really a very lovely place to live and to study. And it's a pity that you cannot be here, but maybe when listening to these lectures or courses, um, uh, people later have the chance uh, to visit Würzburg so, welcome also at Julius Maximilians University at Würzburg, which, like the city, is a very old and ancient university. You can see that it is an old university simply from the fact that the building which you see, which is the main building of the university, is called the New University because it was built in 1896. So, the university is much older and it dates back uh, to the 15th century. University was established 1402 by Pope Boniface IX. So it's really one of the oldest universities in the world, one can say. Unfortunately, the first foundation did not last very long. So the university was bankrupt, the rector was killed, 
And so the university was shut down. And so the second uh, foundation was required. And this was in 1582 by Prince Bishop Julius Echter von Mesbelbrunn, a Catholic bishop, Prince Bishop, because Würzburg was until the beginning of the 19th century was kind of a state of its own. It was governed by a bishop who was the Prince Bishop, because he was also the worldly ruler of the city. And this uh, Prince Bishop, uh, Julius Echter of Mesbrunn, he re-established the university uh, with a medical faculty, a theological faculty, a philosophical faculty, and a faculty of law. And you can see the original building on the right side of this, of this chart. And um, well, the second foundation was, was more successful than the first one from then on. University grew and grew and became more and more successful. I think one of the most important things that uh, the world owes to Würzburg are the X-rays, which were detected by Wilhelm Konrad Röntgen when he was teaching at Würzburg University in 1895. Today, uh, the university is a very vital place to study, to teach, and to do research. Uh, we have 10 faculties. Five institutes, professors, 4,000 academic staff, and more than 28,000 students. So it's a very large university. And Würzburg itself has only 120,000 uh, inhabitants. So the university is very much shaping the life and the atmosphere uh, of Würzburg uh, right now under Corona rules. Uh, this is not so much the case, but we're all optimistic that soon, very soon, we'll get back into the old style of life, which was really pleasant and is pleasant at this at this city. So here we are, Würzburg University in Würzburg, in the middle of Europe. And I then want to just present myself shortly and also my two assistants. So I'm Peter Buffinger. I'm a professor of economics here at Würzburg University. I started teaching here in 1991, so it's 30 years ago. Um, and I must say it's still fun to teach. Um, and. Um, since uh, last year, I'm a senior professor for, for economics. Um, I've done many things uh, in my life, but I would say the most important thing I did besides teaching and doing research at the university was being a member of the German Council of Economic Experts. This is one of the most important advisory bodies for the German government, and I served there 15 years. And of course, this is a very interesting uh, position because you are, on the one hand, uh, confronted with policy and policy problems. On the other hand, we try to help uh, economic policy by doing research, by uh, using the theories that you have and to find solutions. And it was a fascinating time these 15 years because we had all kinds of events. We had the financial crisis, we had the euro crisis. Um, so it was a very exciting time to serve at this, at this council. So the research that, that I'm doing today is very much uh, focused on the digitalization of money. As you all know, there are very interesting developments and trends. People talk about Bitcoin, about DM, the currency which Facebook wants to introduce. Central banks are elaborating ways to introduce central bank digital currency. So there's a lot going on. And this is one of the key areas where we are doing research. Other fields of research uh, are mon monetary macroeconomics, European integration, and also teaching. As I said, teaching, in my view, is a lot of fun. Um, it also helps yourself to organize, to structure uh, your thoughts and, and your theories. And that's why uh, we are now having this uh, course, which, as I said, is a new course, and it's a new way uh, to present macroeconomics, and I very much hope that you will enjoy it. The course um, is, is also accompanied by Lisa and Thomas. They both helped me to do all the preparations, uh, but also do all the technical organizational stuff. And I can tell you it's not so easy in this digital world to do it uh, in, a, in the right way. And, and without uh, Lisa and Thomas, I would be definitely lost. Um, and so there are both uh, research assistants here at Würzburg since 2018. They're both writing their dissertations and their fields of research are, of course, related to what I'm doing. So both uh, do research on the nexus between finance and growth um, and on the role of banks in the, in the growth processes. 
Um, and he's also does research on economic inequality, especially in Asia. And uh, Thomas helps me, supports me with the research on digital money. So far, this is our team. Um, this is the place where we are. Okay, so what is the mission of this course? That sounds not very, um, very impressive. But what, what do we want to achieve? What, what do we want to reach with this, with this course? And I would say we have three different uh, objectives. First of all, I think uh, when you attend this course and, and, and after attending it, I think uh, you should be able to have your own understanding of the big economic debates. Uh, and I think something that COVID makes obvious is how important macroeconomic developments are and how interesting it is to deal with these problems of how challenging it is for, for policymakers to find solutions to these very unique problems because uh, since the Second uh, World War, uh, the economies uh, have never been confronted with such a huge challenge like COVID and COVID really makes obvious the key questions of, of macroeconomic policy. And we will all talk about them, discuss them in detail. But the questions, of course, that, that come up uh, in, in the debates, and you can see them almost every day, are questions like, what is, what is the role of government debt? What is the role of government deficits? And uh, we can see in this pandemic that we have unprecedented government deficits in the United States, the government deficit this year will about 15% of, of GDP. This is completely unprecedented. And we see also due to these unprecedented deficits, also unprecedented rise in government debt levels. Uh, in, in Japan, the debt level will be something like 260% of GDP. Uh, in, in Italy, about 160. In the United States, I think it will be something 130, 140%. And of course, these enormous increase in government debt raises the level, there is the question, is government debt, is it a curse or is it a blessing? What are the economic consequences of government debt? And this is something which is at the very heart of macroeconomic discussions. And of course, uh, we will go into this uh, question in detail. And related to the topic of government de deficits is of course, the role of monetary policy, uh, and again, what central banks are doing uh, since the outbreak of the pandemic is also unprecedented. There are unprecedented purchases uh, of government uh, debt by, by the main central banks. Uh, we have also enormous increase uh, in the money supply, especially in the United States, which records the increase of the money stock uh, in two of about 20% and even more. And this raises the question, will we now be confronted with inflation once the pandemic is over? And again, this is a question uh, that you can find almost every day when you open newspapers or when you follow, uh, follow the news on, on, on Twitter or wherever. Um, so um, again, a question where as an economist, you must have your own view, you must be able to make your own assessments. Um, another debate, uh, which is also related to this, um, is the question, um, what can the European Union do to deal uh, with the pandemic? And, and is, is it possible that the EU by itself uh, is able to raise, to raise uh, money by issuing bonds? And here we have this next generation EU fund, which is also something unprecedented uh, in the history of the European Union, because until then um, there was the view that the European Commission is not able to have a deficit, not, not able to raise debt on the national markets. But now we have this uh, next EU generation fund with a volume of 750 uh, billion um, uh, euro. And here, of course, the question arises, is this enough? Do we need more? And Again, something which is very deeply, very, 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 uh, very, very, very directly related to, to macroeconomic issues. 
when we talk about government debt, about inflation, about central banks, then immediately comes up the question, is this, is this not all what modern monetary theory is preaching? And again, if you follow debates, discussions, um, modern monetary theory pops up uh, more and more often. Uh, and um, some prominent economists, economists say, this is a recipe for disaster. And we'll have a look at it and we'll find out, is it really a recipe for disaster or is it not? exactly what central banks and governments are doing today. Um, another topic also related to what we have been saying so far is when we have such low interest rates all over the world, which of course the central banks uh, are, are doing in order to, to support uh, the economies, do these very low interest rates not lead to bubbles, to financial crisis, uh, to a similar uh, situation as we experienced it in 2008. And another topic which is not very much related to, to the European Monetary Union uh, is a question, is it really a good idea that economically strong currencies like Germany or the Netherlands have the same currency as economically relatively weak countries like Greece or, or, uh, or Italy? This is also a topic that we then will discuss in more detail. So when we talk about these big debates, these, these um, very important topics, and when we discuss about them, we will see that all these discussions are based on some kind of economic theory. Even if we are not aware of it, but all what we say about um, economic problems um, is related to some economic theory. And so that's something which is now also something specific for this course is that we want to, to show you uh, the mechanics of key macroeconomic models um, because these mechanics determine very much our, uh, our assessment of economic problems and also our assessment of solutions to uh, economic problems. And what is, I would say, specific for this course is that we want to show you that macroeconomics has a problem or the advantage, however you like it, that we have two different models. And astonishingly, it is not often made very explicit when, when professors make introductions uh, into macroeconomics. There are two completely different models. And these two completely different models lead to completely different assessments of problems and also very often to completely different policy implications. And this is something which is the very core of, of this lecture to show how these models shape our uh, understanding of economics. And the main problem in my view of many market economic introductions is that this is not made explicit. And so, of course, students are confused because depending which model you use, you come to different outcomes. And if you do not make it explicit, then uh, it's obvious that you will get a lot of confusion. And the confusion gets even worse as some prominent economists believe that these two models are compatible with each other. That one model is good for the short term, the other model is good, good for the longer or medium term. But if you have two problems that are completely incompatible with each other, how can it be that the short term model A applies and the long term model B applies? Anyhow, I think this is some of the core uh, uh, features of, of this course to make explicit the functioning, uh, the laws of motion of these two different models to show to everybody that they're really incompatible and also then to show how, depending on which model you choose, get completely different policy implications. Okay, and of course, what's also important when, when we talk about the mechanics of models is that the functioning of the models does not fall from heaven. The functioning of the models depends on how we design them. So I think that's also very important. How is, this, is, is a model designed? And again, this is normally also not made explicit. So people have the feeling somehow, the model is, is reality and that's how why it functions. No, each model is designed in a specific way. The design of the model determines the mechanics of the model. And this is something 
that uh, we want to make explicit. And finally, I think that's the third specific feature of the course is that this is a course for the European Union and more specifically for the Euro area. Um, when you have normal traditional um, macroeconomic introductions, most of them are for the United States. They are somehow uh, adapt, adapted to Europe or to, to other countries, but the key uh, design of, of the typical um, macroeconomic textbooks is for the United States. And of course, if you want to know something about the United States, it's fine, but if you take the model and if you take the textbook uh, and for the United States and you apply it to the Euro area, um, then you have a problem because the Euro area is a completely different animal than the United States. And so far, there are, in my view, not very convincing uh, macroeconomic introductions concerning the Euro area, but the Euro area needs a specific, a tailored macroeconomic introduction because it's a specific animal. And why differs the Euro area from a large economic area like the United States? Well, I think the main difference is that while they both, the United States and the Euro area, have one currency, a one currency area, um, the main difference is that the uh, United States is completely integrated in terms of fiscal policy while in the Euro area, we have 19 independent national fiscal policies. This, of course, makes a huge difference, especially for macroeconomic policy, where fiscal policy, as you can see in the case of uh, this COVID pandemic, where fiscal policy has an important role to play. And of course, it's much more difficult now to organize the fiscal policy response if you have 19 players um, in instead of one player like the like United States. And so the euro area needs specific, specific macroeconomic uh, presentation and you cannot just use a um, United States textbook to deal with the issues, problems of the euro area. And of course, in, in addition to the lack of fiscal policy integration, we have the problem in the euro area that the individual countries, and there's still individual countries, they cannot use the exchange rate instrument can no longer cannot devalue uh, their their currencies if they have if they have problems with competitiveness, and of course, uh, additional problem is related uh, to the fact that in the monetary union you have 19 member states, but you have only one interest rate. So this kind of one size fits all interest rate, which is also a very specific challenge uh, for marketing policy in the euro area. I think these are the three main features, policy-oriented, clear, clearly focused on different modeling approaches and third, uh, a specific approach and focus on the, on the Euro area. So what is the outline of this course? We have, uh, so to say, seven chapters, uh, which we, which we uh, you know, present to you. We'll start, and that's we can also start with this already today, uh, with the objectives of macroeconomic policy. Because when you talk about macroeconomic policy, you must make clear what does macroeconomic policy want to achieve. Uh, and we'll then also discuss a little bit the performance of the euro area um, in terms of these macroeconomic policy objectives. Then in the second part, We'll talk about the mechanics of the two core macroeconomic models. Uh, and these models are on the one hand, the kind of classical, neoclassical model. Uh, and uh, the other model is, is the Keynesian monetary model. And we will discuss all the features and differences in these two models in detail. And then uh, in the third part, we will talk about the diverging policy implications of these two paradigms, especially uh, for monetary policy, for fiscal policy, for stabilization policy, but also for inflation and also for, for the financial system and, and uh, also for the role of government debt. Um, then in the fourth part, we present you a simple Keynesian macroeconomic model, 
because it's also helpful to have a very simple formal model to discuss macroeconomic topics. Um, and then we, in, in the fifth part, uh, then we will focus on the ECB um, as a kind of main player of economic policy in the euro area. And of course, we'll also discuss the specific challenges uh, for monetary policy uh, in this COVID pandemic. Um, then in part six, um, we'll address the difficulties that, as I mentioned, arise from having 19 independent member states in one monetary area. How can you coordinate these policies? How can you avoid free rider uh, behavior? And of course, in this context, a key uh, uh, topic is the stability and growth pact, which is an institutional framework for national fiscal policies uh, in the euro area. And um, what is really interesting in this context is the question, is this framework, this stability and growth pact, is, can, we, can we still use it, use it and apply it after we have had all these changes in fiscal policy caused by the COVID pandemic? And then finally, in the seventh part, we, we will discuss some specific uh, topics related to the monetary union, the euro crisis, especially in the years 2011-2012, what uh, were the triggers for this crisis, how were this crisis solved. Uh, we'll talk about the theory of optimum currency areas, the question that I've already addressed, is it really a good idea to have countries which are very uh, wealthy, which have, are very productive, uh, to have these countries together um, with countries with relatively low levels of wealth, low levels of productivity, is it a good idea that these countries have the same currency? And uh, I think if you have time, you can also talk about now what's going on at the EU level, the question uh, of this next generation EU fund, the question how can the European Union as a whole deal with the challenges that not only the challenges of COVID, but also the challenges of climate change, of digitalization, of the whole economic transformation how can they deal with these challenges? Okay, this is in short what we want to talk about uh, in the next few weeks. And uh, if you have any questions so far, any suggestions so far, please let me know. Okay, then let's start uh, with the first topic, objectives of macroeconomic policy and the performance of the euro area. Yeah, when we talk about macroeconomic policy, of course, question is what does macroeconomic policy want to achieve? Therefore, we also have to talk about the targets of macroeconomic policy. And, and when talking about the targets of monetary macroeconomic policy, um, one has to first clarify what is macroeconomics all about. And in a somewhat simplified way, one can say microeconomics is about the equilibrium between the supply and the demand for goods on a specific market. That's, that's more or less the key uh, topic in, in microeconomics. You have individual markets, individual goods. And the question is how can you achieve an equilibrium between supply and demand on these individual markets? And macroeconomics is similar to microeconomics in the sense that it is concerned with the demand and supply, but not for an individual good or for an individual market, but with demand and supply for the whole economy. So it's concerned with aggregate supply and aggregate demand. And that's the very core of macroeconomics. And that this equilibrium matters um, becomes obvious when we ask ourselves what happens if we do not have an equilibrium of aggregate demand and aggregate supply. And we can differentiate between two cases. One, if aggregate demand is too low compared to aggregate supply, we get unemployment. And we definitely do not want to have unemployment. On the other hand, if there's too much aggregate demand compared to aggregate supply, we get inflation. And we also do not want to have inflation. So um, this balance of aggregate demand and aggregate supply matters a lot and 
somehow simplified, we can say macroeconomic policies are always concerned about achieving a balance between aggregate supply and demand. And um, this role of equilibrium of aggregate demand and aggregate supply and the impact of uh, excess demand or excess supply on unemployment and inflation has led to um, catalogs where, uh, where macroeconomic targets are formulated and prescribed, so to say, as a, as a list of, of objectives for policymakers. And in, at the European level, these targets are formulated in the Treaty on European Union, Article 3. And um, this article says, the union shall establish an internal market. It shall work for the sustainable development of Europe based on balanced economic growth. Balance means supply, demand should be somehow balanced. And price stability, a highly competitive social market economy aiming at full employment and social progress. And finally, a high level of protection and improvement of the quality of the environment. And taking these targets together, one can form a kind of magic quadrangle of economic objectives, balanced growth, full employment, price stability, and quality of the environment. And magic, why, why do we talk about a magic quadrangle? Um, well, the magic comes from the fact that, of course, there are trade offs between these, these targets. and we will discuss uh, these trade-offs, sometimes there are also complementarities, um, but depending on the shocks with, with which an economy is confronted, sometimes there are trade-offs, sometimes there are no trade-offs, uh, and we will discuss this in uh, more detail. So let's go on looking at these targets, growth, price stability for employment. Um, how can these targets be defined? And also, we can also then ask, is it possible to reach these targets? How was the performance of the euro area? And above all, how was the performance of the member states of the euro area since 1992? For those outside Germany, um, maybe one, one should mention that the euro area is uh, the group of countries that have the euro as their currency. And uh, we have the euro as a as a common currency um, since 1999. So in 1999, the Europe started. Um, and uh, th therefore, uh, when we look now at the economic developments uh, of these member states, we always started in 1999 when the euro was established. So the euro is now uh, 20, 22 years old. So but it's always come, come to age, so it's no longer a child. So anyhow, so. Let's look at these, at these objectives in more detail. How can we formulate them? How can we define them? How can we clarify them? Um, let's start with the objective of balanced economic growth. It sounds nice. And of course, the question is how can we define balanced economic growth? Um, and um, it's interesting to see, if you just look at, at the data, that the growth performance of major currency areas is quite different from 99 to 2020. So since the start of the Euro, the Euro area economy grew just by an annual average of 0.9%, which is not huge. Yes. Of course, um, this average is now very much um, influenced by the very strong uh, decline of GDP in 2020, even the Euro area experienced decline of economic growth of about 8% or so. So it would have looked a little bit better <laughs> in, in 2019, but well, we have had now uh, the, uh, this COVID crisis. Um, and that different growth paths can be achieved. This is shown by China, who by an impressive 8.6%, but also the United States did much better by 1.8%. So, Growth performances can be can be different, and um, of course the question is what determines growth. I think in the case of China, it's relatively easy. It's a country 
uh, which has, still has a lot of catch up uh, in, in terms of, of economic uh, uh, of economic growth. And, and of course, China has, has shown a very impressive growth story. The United States still grow at about twice uh, the growth rate uh, of, of the euro area. So these are interesting questions. How can, can we explain this, this growth differences? And of course, when we talk about the target of economic growth, question that always arises is the question, why not zero growth? Do we need growth at all? Is it a good idea, after all, to have a growth target for economic policy? And maybe some of you want to comment on this? Would it be a good idea to have no growth at all? So I must say, in, a, in earlier times, before COVID, when I gave uh, lectures to a larger audience, very often the question was raised, hey, professor, is it really a good idea to have growth? Do we need growth at all? Why not zero growth? Because we, we are living in a world with limited resources and we, if we have growth, uh, exponential growth every year, isn't that, isn't that a major problem? No, no views from the audience. Nobody, please, can also send a written comment. Nobody, hundred, how many? Yeah, hundred eleven. Hundred eleven. Well, um, I mean, we got we got some feedback. Um, yeah. Well, it's not realistic to expect the underdeveloped world to give up on material wealth or no growth, no innovation. Yeah, well, I think that's the, the role of innovation is very important. I think, after all, I think it's very difficult for economic policy to target a certain growth rate over a longer period of time. Because what determines economic growth over the longer term, and I think what really matters is of course population growth. If you are countries growing strongly like India um, or, or China, then just population growth leads also to economic growth because you have more, more people and you have more people working. And of course, uh, overall, you get economic growth. Um, but of course, you can also have growth with, this, with, this, with a constant population. And in this case, Growth comes from uh, mainly from innovation, from new technologies, from from people who are more productive, from people who are more skilled. So, as a, as a, as a government, uh, if you want to have more growth, it's not that you can say I want to have one, two, three, or four percent growth. Uh, in order to achieve growth, you have to invest in. Uh, in the people, you have to have to improve their education. You need universities. You have to do a lot of research, um, and so I think the question is not how much growth we want to have. The question is what can we do to uh, give our give our people a better education? How can we? What can we do to to produce in a more productive way? What can we do to foster innovation? And in the end, this leads to more growth. It's fine. But just proclaiming we want three, four, five, or six percent growth without investing in the people, without investing in technology, uh, you won't achieve it. And therefore, I think that's the wrong question to say we want we want growth. What we want is, of course, people who have, get, have a good education. We want to have people uh, that live in a country uh, with a good infrastructure, with, with with modern technologies, and then in the end you get growth. But but I think. Numerical growth targets uh, in mo most countries don't do it. I think China still does it. It has some, some kind of medium term growth targets, but I think all other countries do not have an explicit growth target. So if you look at what President Biden is, is doing right now, uh, he says, okay, I want to invest in infrastructure, I want to invest in the people, but he doesn't say, I want a growth target for the United States of five or six or seven percent. So I think. GDP as a medium-term growth objective of market policy does not really exist. Um, 
is GDP a good indicator of the quality of life? So many people uh, discuss the role of, of, of GDP as, as an indicator of the quality of life. And of course, it's not a good indicator uh, of the quality of quality of life. So there's expertise of the German and the French Council of Economic Experts in 2011. And I also contributed to this expertise. And the key message is uh, here the first and most important conclusion of our study that a single indicator approach to measuring human progress is inherently insufficient. So I think nobody, no, no economist uh, proclaims that GDP is the only indicator uh, of, of, of economic policy, that, that all that matters is, is GDP growth. I think most, almost all economists agree that you look, have to look at a lot of different indicators. And uh, uh, so this, uh, expertise of this of this council said okay of course you have to look at economic performance in terms of GDP but also have to look at the quality of life indicators like health like education and of course you have also to look at sustainability indicators like the quality of the environment and so on. So GDP should not be uh, overrated and the only case the only place where GDP really matters is for short-term economic fluctuations. So if you have a situation right now uh, when in some countries uh, the GDP goes down by 10% in one year in 2020, of course, GDP is then a very important yardstick to see how we can get back to the previous level of economic uh, output of, of, uh, of economic uh, well-being. And so for these very short-term fluctuations, uh, uh, GDP really, really matters. And of course, that's why we all ask now how fast will the pre-crisis GDP level uh, be reached again? What can be done to get back to this level? So as a short-term indicator, um, GDP is really, is really very important. So we got uh, quite a question regarding GDP. Uh, what exactly is GDP measuring and why is it too limited? Yeah, GDP measures uh, the output of an economy in one year, the output in terms of goods, in terms of services. Um, and so and in this, so it's, it's, a, it's a flow variable that really shows what the value added that is created uh, in the economy. And the question is then, was then? And why is this measure too limited? Yes, that leads me now to my, uh, leads me now to what I just have here. Um, so, of course, one problem of GDP is it doesn't me measure the environmental damages that are created when you, when you, when you produce this value added. So if you, um, if you produce value added, uh, but you pollute the economy uh, highly with this, with this production, um, this is not should, should be deducted in principle from the value added because it's kind of input uh, of creating this value added. But this is this is not uh, this is not recorded in GDP. Then of course the distribution of incomes is neglected. So if you have a high level. Of, um, of, of GDP, but it's very unequally distributed. And of course, some people are very happy about it, but many people are not so happy about it. So for instance, in the United States uh, or also in China, where the distribution of incomes is very unequal, um, GDP says something about the value added and that comes to the uh, economy as a whole, but it does not say something about the happiness of, of the people because uh, if there are many, many people who do not benefit from this high level of GDP, uh, it's, it's, it's bad for the economic well-being of, of the nation. Well, and then, of course, in GDP, you have some uh, you have value added, which is not really related to well-being. So if you have a society where there are many road accidents and you have to repair all the cars, this is included uh, in GDP as value added, but of course, it could be better to have no accidents and not to have the value added for repairing cars. And then finally, um, GDP only records market transactions, so transactions for which payment is made. And so if people 
do a lot of, of work by themselves. For instance, if they, if they are doing some kind of farming uh, at, at their houses, or if, if people uh, do, do a lot of care, care work at home, um, this is all not included in GDP. So um, therefore one has to be very careful when using GDP as a measure of economic well-being, and one has to be also very careful when using GDP as, as, as an indicator for, for inter-country comparisons. For instance, GDP in the United States is relatively high compared to the GDP in Germany, but people in the United States work much more. There are much more working hours required uh, to produce this, this GDP in Germans like to have it a little bit more relaxed. And therefore one has to be careful when saying, okay, GDP in the United States is higher than Germany. Therefore the quality of life in the uh, United States is higher than Germany. Well, I do have a yeah. couple of questions too. Yeah. Um, I might be a little late to the party with the first one, but it's about the zero growth. Why well, no zero growth? Um, why is there no specific growth target for uh, most countries? Because isn't it always better to have a specific target than to just walk into the indefinite future and just see what happens? Yeah, it's a good question. So as I said, in Germany, we never had any growth targets. There was never a chancellor uh, saying uh, in the next four years, we won't have so and so much growth. I think, um, what, what, we, what we always have is that we have some targets for unemployment. So if unemployment is very high, then people say we want to get unemployed lower. And, um, but it's a good question. So I think if, if you, if, so in Germany, we will have now the general elections uh, in September, and there are all kinds of programs by the political parties. And if you look at these programs, they all say we want to have a better life for our people. And we want to also have a better, we want to, to to protect the environment, we want to be innovative, uh, we want to have an uh, econo economy uh, with a lot of uh, social um, social um, safe, safety systems with social um, redistribution elements. But yeah, if you look at these programs, no program says you want to have one, two, three or four percent of, of, of GDP. Yeah, maybe as, because I, as I said, it's, it's very difficult to target an economy in that way. You know, it's not just like a machine where you say, uh, or like a car, I want to have a speed of 100 kilometers or 80 kilometers, 120 kilometers. You can always try to contribute to growth by investing in education, by investing in research and development, by investing in infrastructure. And in the end, you get some growth, yeah? But, um, I think because of, as, as it's not possible to target in a direct way, that's maybe the reason why if you look at all these electoral programs, uh, you won't find any, any complete uh, figures for, for economic growth. Okay. Be okay. Is it maybe because uh, the politicians are afraid that they couldn't reach the target they're setting for themselves? That might be also, might be also, might be also a possible explanation. So in the end, if, if the election, if, if the, at the end of, of um, the legis legislative period, uh, then if you promise 3% growth, it's only 2%, yeah, maybe. maybe. But that's a really interesting question. And, um, and yeah, astonishingly, most countries do not have these, these concrete uh, medium-term growth targets. But thank you for the question. And thank you for using the camera. Very appreciate it. Uh, no problem. I, I actually have another question, if that's possible. Um, yes. And it was about uh, adding value. I'm not sure if it was Keynes, but uh, we had this example of setting up a hole with uh, trash and burying some cash in it and yeah. having people uh, digging the cash out yeah. and therefore increasing the value that it, that is created in uh, a specific economy. Isn't that like isn't that adding value? Like, not really. <laughs> so that's a good, ex good, good uh, uh, example. So his idea that you dig bottles with uh, banknotes in it, and, that, and then people have to dig it out again. Um, I think the value 
is only great if people use the money in the bottles to spend it and then help okay. to create economic activities in a situation where, where the economy is in a deep recession. Yeah? So, so okay. the problem of recession is that, that, that the whole system uh, is, is not running at full capacity and it's a kind of downward spiral. So if the, if, if the hairdresser doesn't go to the restaurant, the guy who runs the restaurant uh, does not buy a new pair of trousers and so on and so on and so on and injecting the money, then people go and spend the money and then you can get out of the vicious circle. Okay. Then you create value, value added. Right. Yeah? Thank okay, you. Good, good. Thank you for the questions. Um, and thank you for using uh, the, the camera. Okay, so I think we have now uh, somehow addressed the problems of, of uh, GDP as, as a wealth indicator. And if you're really interested in these details, you can really look at this expertise here. Maybe, maybe we should also have done that so far. We should also send you a list of, of, of uh, literature, relevant literature. Uh, so we haven't done that so far, but you will get this, uh, all kinds of things that we think you might read, should you read, could read. Uh, for this course. Okay, so only uh, one short. Um, uh, if I can have a question, please. Yeah. Yeah. Riga, especially like economies in Europe, where most of the society has already reached to a bare minimum uh, requirement to live a good life. So, don't you think there is any link between the increase in population and the growth targets that, that you have already said there is, there, there is no growth targets, but anyhow, just for the sake of comparison, because now your only thing you have to do is to get extra resources for increased population. So, so you're, uh, if I understand you correctly, you said uh, the more wealthy people are, the populations are, the, the more they think that growth is not needed. Did you take it right? No. Is this what, 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 what you want to say? Uh, um, I mean to say that at after a certain level, when yeah. you have already achieved uh, basic requirements to live a life, give, live a happy life. So yeah. does this mean after that level, the growth target have some link with the with the population growth? Because the, after a certain level, you only have to meet the additional requirement of ah. the additional population. Okay, okay. yeah. Um, is a question is whether there's some kind of, of satisfaction level. So if people reach a certain amount of, of material wealth and people are all satisfied, and then you only need more growth for the, for, for the increase of population. If there are more people, then that's the only way, um, only way why you need growth. Well, I think... Agreed. Um, well, I think that the, if you look at the societies, the idea that you reach a kind of satisfaction level where people say, now we have so many goods, we do not need more. Um, so far, it, it has not been reached. Yeah? So if, if you compare, uh, of course, uh, the, the, the level of material wealth that we have in all countries, of course, it's, it's much, much higher than 20 years, 40 years, 100 years ago. Yeah? And, but still, I think even in the countries where we have a very high level of GDP per capita, like the United States, of course, um, the, the wealth is very unequally distributed. So also the United States have a very high, uh, high income on, on, on aggregate. Of course, income distribution is very unequal. And, uh, and there are so many people in the United States who still live under the poverty line. Yeah? And, and therefore, for, for the for the society as a whole, I think we are still far away from a situation where we say, like country for the United States, now we can stop growing because we have now reached such a high level of GDP and everybody's happy. No, uh, even in the very uh, wealthy countries, there are so many people who are still very poor so that, that you also need growth for the poorer people to get out of, of their misery. Yeah? Okay, but thank you also for the question. And so, what is quite interesting but is, is to look a little bit of about the relation between happiness and, um, and GDP. And there's the World Happiness Report 2020. Um, and um, 
you can see, of course, that the countries that are very happy, Finland, Denmark, Switzerland, Iceland, Norway, Netherlands, Sweden, are of course also countries with very high GDP levels. I think that's quite, quite obvious. So there is obviously relation uh, between GDP uh, per capita and happiness. Also, these World Happiness Reports also has other, uh, other uh, determinants of happiness like social support, uh, life expectancy, freedom to make choices and so on and so on. But, but it's obvious that the very happy countries are very uh, wealthy countries. On the other hand, if you look at the lower end of the scale, these are really poor countries um, with very low GDP. But of course, then a low level of GDP is also associated with the low uh, state of, of, of health of the population, also probably uh, with a low uh, level of, of, uh, of, of stability uh, in, in, in the country. And, and so I think there's definitely a very strong relationship between GDP and, and the happiness of, of the people. So if you look at the performance of the uh, member states of the euro area in terms of growth, as I said, overall, it was not a very dynamic uh, growth that was recorded in the euro area since the euro was introduced. But then we can see nevertheless differences among the member states. We have countries uh, which had relatively low growth. We have only here the larger member states. So Greece, Italy, Portugal had on the left side of, of the chart uh, had, had uh, below average growth. So the red uh, line is the Euro area. Uh, so we can see uh, these countries in Southern Europe had, had, a, had a very uh, weak growth performance. Uh, Greece is quite interesting because in the beginning, the first years of the uh, monetary union, it was very dynamic, but then uh, the Euro crisis, the country experienced a real depression and is now um, the country uh, with, the, with the lowest growth performance together with Italy. Italy, as we can see, has obviously chronical problems, so it was never very dynamic, uh, but it's, it's, the, it's together with, with Greece, one of the weakest uh, member states. Then in the middle, you have this kind of medium growth, large member states like Germany and France. And uh, on the right, you have countries that are more dynamic, like Spain, Belgium, Austria, Finland, Netherlands, so some of these smaller countries are obviously more dynamic than, than the average. You can uh, see here very much uh, the uh, effect here on, of the financial crisis. Uh, in 2009, of course, you can see it here, uh, also the effect of the COVID pandemic, and you can see it's even more severe than the financial crisis. Let's talk a little bit about the other uh, two targets, full employment, um, which is raised in the, uh, in the treaty, in the European treaty. Um, like Ben's growth, there is no definition of what is full employment. Um, traditionally, one, one says, well, if we have reached an uh, unemployment rate of 4%, this is more or less close to full, un to full employment. And uh, if you look uh, to the United States, I think this fits a little bit with what they have been able to achieve. You can see uh, while the unemployment rate in the United States is relatively low compared to the unemployment rate in the Euro area, they've also been able really to reach this 4% level, but are not able to get below this. So 4% maybe is something like uh, a level of unemployment, which we could uh, call, uh, we could label as, as full employment. So uh, why, why don't we get uh, unemployment rates of below 4%? I think this has a lot to do um, that there is something what we call natural rate of unemployment. Um, and uh, such a natural rate of unemployment is related to frictional unemployment, so people change from one job to another and do not immediately find a new job. There's also seasonal unemployment in the construction sector, in the uh, tourism industry. There's also regional unemployment because some regions are in a specific way affected by um, structural changes. And of course, 
to some degree, there's also something like voluntary unemployment. Some people um, do not do not uh, want to work because they have the feeling that the, um, that the support that they get from the unemployment scheme uh, is enough, and they do not make enough efforts to find a job. So anyhow, four percent is probably something like a, a lower bound uh, for for uh, the unemployment rate. And uh, as you can see from the chart, um, the euro area uh, is far away from from four percent. And even um, at the end of 2019, uh, the unemployment rate was a little bit below eight percent. So definitely, uh, the euro area has has much more labor market problems uh, than, than the United States. And uh, we can also look a little bit uh, again at the distribution of the unemployment problems in the Euro area. And here we see that uh, Greece is definitely a country which has the most serious unemployment problems, um, but also Spain, that's quite an interesting. Also, it has been growing quite well. It has, it has traditional problems with youth unemployment, so unemployment is also relatively high here. And also Italy is a, is a country with chronic unemployment problems. Then we have larger member states with kind of average um, employment situation, and this is France, Portugal, and Finland. And uh, we have on the right, uh, we have states, member states with a relatively positive labor market performance. Uh, this is Germany, the Netherlands, Austria, Ireland, and Belgium. Um, what you what you can see uh, in this chart is uh, the strong impact of uh, the financial crisis and the euro crisis on the labor markets of some countries, countries that were very strongly affected by the euro crisis had more serious unemployment problems. So we have here. Greece and, and Spain, very much affected by the euro crisis. We have Portugal uh, and we have also Ireland. So these countries were the uh, most seriously affected by the euro crisis. And it's also interesting to see why some countries had been able to get the unemployment rates, uh, get to, to, to reduce unemployment rates considerably, like uh, Ireland and, and Portugal. Uh, Countries like Spain, Italy, and Greece are still suffering in relatively high unemployment rates. So let me now turn to price stability. Can I have a question on unemployment. Yes. Uh, isn't unemployment a result of insufficient aggregate demand, or is it as a result of insufficient government spending? Yeah, that's a good question. And of course, we'll discuss it in more detail when we talk about stabilization policies. I think what, what you what we can say is that there's obviously no single answer uh, uh, to this to this question. There's no single reason uh, for unemployment because we have now these uh, larger member states, and um, you see the data from 1999 to 2020, uh, and you can see the performance is very different. Now, so it's not not that all countries have the same problems. You can see that they're all little, somehow affected um, by. By the euro crisis, but even the euro crisis, you can see, was, was really focused on, on four member states. Um, and um, you can see that, that some countries did, did relatively well. Um, some countries also improved their situation. So Germany was at a relatively high unemployment rate in 2005, and it's now one of the lowest uh, unemployment rates in, in the euro area. Some countries um, like like France had a relatively stable unemployment rate because they still live to try, but it's relatively stable. So um, there's no, no, no one answer that, that, that can, with which you can uh, now uh, explain these, these situations. I think what one can say, of course, that unemployment always has, has two main uh, uh, causes one, of course, is cyclical unemployment. If you have a major recession, of course, unemployment goes up, and that's why we need stabilization policies. And uh, and uh, we'll, we'll discuss this. Uh, but of course, there are also some kind of structural problems that countries are obviously not competitive enough uh, to to find jobs for all for all people uh, in in their society and. and uh, It's, 
is definitely not okay. They just have not enough money into the system that we all, that all, uh, that all people who are unemployed uh, get jobs. Yeah? And so I think that's kind of balancing act. Of course, aggregate demand is a main um, driver of, of economic growth and economic growth, of course, is required to get, uh, to, to create more jobs. So that's definitely important. Um, but it's a balancing act. If you just spend more money, um, it can also, of course, then lead to inflation. And so one has to be very careful in making uh, general uh, statements on, on this on this situation. Okay. Good. Now let us just turn to the third. Of, so we had balanced growth, we had full employment, and then we had this third macroeconomic target, this catalog of the treaty with price stability. Price stability is, of course, also uh, an important uh, economic objective. Why is price stability important? Well, I think many, many people uh, have to save money for their retirement. Many people do not have their own house. Many people are afraid to buy, to buy uh, shares. And so, so many, many people for retirement have saved a lot of money in financial assets like, like government bonds, like corporate bonds, they just have it on savings books. And so if now as a, as a consequence of COVID, we would end up with 20 or 30, 40% inflation, then of course, all these savings um, of large parts of the population would be destroyed. And that of course would lead to, to terrible uh, social consequences and we have experiences in Germany uh, in the beginning of the 1920s of the last century, where we had this hyperinflation and uh, just the middle classes lost all the money that they had saved for their retirement. Of course, this then leads to a lot of social uh, instability and, and social problems. And therefore, price stability is a very important target of economic policy. Also, um, in, in the sense that uh, we have economies in which money plays a decisive role and will of course, uh, go into this in more detail. And money cannot function uh, if the value of money is fluctuating very much. So look at Bitcoin today, uh, these days with these huge fluctuations of, of the Bitcoin price, and you could not have an economy based on Bitcoin uh, where the value of the money goes up 50% in some months and then declines by 30% and so on and so on. So uh, a Bitcoin economy was definitely not possible because money is needed for our societies, for our economies. Money can only be useful if it has a somewhat little value. Uh, therefore, of course, uh, uh, all the central banks of the world uh, try to keep uh, inflation rate of their currencies low. And uh, in, in the case of the euro area, uh, the European Central Bank has given a quantitative definition of its target. Um, and, and it said here in 1998, when it, when it started uh, with its operation, it said we want price stability is defined as a year on year increase in the harmonized index of consumer prices for the euro area of below 2% in the medium term. So below 2%, that was when they started in 1998. But then people ask below 2%, does this mean that zero is also uh, in line with the amended. And uh, it took the ECB five years until 2003 when they said, no, no, um, we want to maintain inflation rates below, but close to 2% over the medium term. And so more or less, you can say the ECB's target is, is about 2%. Yeah? But of course, the precise definition is Below but close to 2% of the medium term. It's a little bit easy to be specific. Most central banks say 2%, but I think it doesn't make a, a fundamental difference. And um, the ECB said they want to reach this target over the medium term, and that means the short term fluctuations above or below this 2% target are possible. And so already from this 2003 um, definition that is over the medium term, it was clear that this target must be symmetric, but was then clarified later on by Mario Draghi 
in 2016, he said, uh, we'll have to define the medium term in a way that if the inflation rate was for a long time below 2%, it will be above 2% for some time. The key point is that the governing council is symmetric in the definition of the objective of price stability over the medium term. And uh, all the ECB and also the Fed have a lot of uh, discussions on uh, their strategy and they're reviewing their strategy. And last year, the Federal Reserve, the US Central Bank has reviewed its strategy and has precisely the same way as the ECB stated that they want to maintain their target over the medium term and that this target must be symmetric. And uh, the Fed chairman Powell has explained it in a way say, okay, if you want people to expect 2% of the medium term for inflation, then of course it must be sometimes below, but also sometimes above 2%, because otherwise expectations will not be centered on 2%, but on something below 2%. So this is the uh, ECB's inflation target. The ECB is reviewing its strategy uh, these, these days, and I'm not sure whether the first results of this strategic review will come out uh, in, this, in this semester, so we can talk about it, but anyhow, we will definitely say more about the ECB's um, uh, monetary policy strategy. So again, let's look uh, at the, at the uh, performance of the Euro area in terms of this objective. And here we can say, well, um, overall the ECB was, was able to achieve this target in a quite, uh, quite impressive way. So uh, inflation in the, Euro area was rel relatively close, I would say, to this 2%. And um, to the surprise of many Germans who were afraid that this European Central Bank would create a lot of inflation. So in Germany, there were lots of debates and fears in the 1990s. If we get this uh, European Central Bank, they will not pay sufficient attention to inflation and they will no longer have to stay your money. But uh, as you can see from this chart, the average inflation rate was impressively close to the 2%. Um, and uh, since uh, the euro crisis, one can, the inflation rate was even a little bit too low, was, was under uh, the, the ECB's target. Um, what is quite interesting is also to see uh, the, the dispersion of the inflation rates. The blue line is always the country with the highest inflation rate in the euro area. The red line is the, the Dark blue is the country uh, with the highest inflation rate, and the light blue is the countries with the lowest inflation rate. Over time, you can see there was quite a dispersion in inflation rates, especially in the beginning. Um, and of course, that, that this dispersion of inflation rates is a problem for, for the euro area, because if countries have relatively high inflation rates, um, their real interest rate which is the ECB's policy rate minus inflation uh, is relatively low in countries who have a low inflation rate, for them the real inflation rate is relatively high. So as we have this one fits all interest rate policy, uh, different inflation rates in the member states uh, reduce effectiveness of the ECB's monetary policy. And um, so fortunately um, the uh, dispersion has, has, has declined, declined over time. And um, this, this makes interest rate policy more effective. Here in the chart, you can see this period where uh, inflation was trending downwards. Uh, and so even the country with the highest inflation rate was below the ECB's target. And at that time, uh, Mario Draghi, who was at that time the ECB president, started with this very expansionary monetary policy actions, purchasing large amounts of government debt in order to stimulate economy, and I would say overall, he has been quite successful doing this. Uh, we got a question. Uh, could you please explain the concept of the real interest rate again? Yes. Uh, real interest rate means uh, you, you take the nominal interest rate. So if, 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 uh, if you have uh, your, your uh, savings the problem is <laughs> at the moment that all interest rates are zero. So that makes it, <laughs> it makes it so difficult. But in normal times, we had a savings book. You got, let's say, 2% uh, interest rate on it. 
And so from this 2%, you can you deduct the inflation rate because let's say if you get 2% on your savings book and the inflation rate is 2%, at the end of the year, the real value of, your, of, of the money that you have in your savings book is just, just, just remain constant. Yeah? And so um, what matters if you save money, of course, at the end of the day is what can you buy for this money? And of course, one element uh, is, is the interest rate that you get pay on the money uh, that you save, but then of course, you also have to take into account the inflation rate um, because it determines what, how much uh, you can buy uh, for the money that you have at the savings book at the end of the year. Okay, so then we are almost at the end. I think we need some more minutes longer. I hope that's, that's fine with you. Um, so now we have talked about these targets of macroeconomic policy, price stability, balance growth, and, and full employment. And uh, if you want to discuss now uh, the relationship and the trade-offs uh, between, between these targets, it's very difficult to use three targets. And therefore, uh, one can try to reduce the targets from three to, to two, and you can do this in a kind of simplified way. If you say, well, we observe that over time, um, unemployment uh, fluctuations and fluctuations of GDP, cyclical fluctuations of GDP are related. And so one can say, okay, uh, if you have these three targets, let's substitute unemployment just by the output fluctuations. And that reduces uh, three targets to two targets, and it's easier than to handle these two targets in a formal way uh, than the three targets. And the cyclical fluctuations of output uh, are typically measured um, by the so-called output gap. Output gap is a very uh, macroeconomic analysis. And the logic is, is relatively simple. So we assume that we have a trend growth, that we have trend growth here of output, and then um, in a kind of, of textbook style, we assume that the actual output is fluctuating around this trend growth of output. And then, of course, we have situations here that the actual output is below, is below the trend output. We have all situations when the actual output is above trend output. And these deviations of the actual output from trend output is what we, uh, what we define as output gap. The output gap is therefore kind of measure of the cyclical situation of the, of the economy. And we also assume, of course, that also the employment situation fluctuates, fluctuates in parallel uh, with the fluctuations of output. And the analytical concept of the output gap is given by this equation here. Uh, this equation says the output gap uh, is defined as the actual output, yt, minus the potential output, which is kind of this, this trend, trend output, um, divided by potential output. And so the output gap measures the deviation of the actual output from full employment of potential output. Um, so that's a very, very useful concept uh, for macroeconomic analysis. And there are all kinds of international institutions who calculate these output gaps uh, for, for all countries. Output gap is a, is a concept which is easy to describe, but difficult to measure. And so also, it plays a very important role uh, in macroeconomic analysis. It's, it's also a concept uh, that is, is uh, prone to many revisions and, and, uh, and also different ways to calculate, but it's important to know it. So that's one, uh, one way to, to look at cyclical fluctuations of an economy. And you can see here, these are the calculations by the OECD. You can see the financial crisis. The major economies had huge negative output gaps. Now, of course, with COVID, output gaps are even higher, of course, logically. If many stores are closed, if the hotels are closed, if, if uh, yeah, this also has, of course, a lot of effects on, on, on the industries that are producing goods for these stores. Uh, and so, of course, we have now a very, very high negative output gap in all, all major economies. So, 
AutoGET is one important uh, element, and then we can use the output gap together with the inflation gap as a kind of macroeconomic loss function. Let me talk first about the inflation gap. And the inflation gap is just the difference of the actual inflation rate minus the inflation target of the central bank. As I said, the ECB has an inflation target of 2%. Um, and then you can just easily measure the inflation gap and just take uh, actual inflation minus the inflation target. And this inflation gap and the output gap can, can be combined in a, kind, in a macroeconomic loss function that measures macroeconomic loss as the sum of the, of the inflation gap, the inflation gap and the output gap. And, um, uh, and this lamp, factor lambda is used to, uh, to give, uh, to, to determine the importance of the, of the output gap relatively to the inflation gap. If you have lambda equal to one, the output gap uh, and, um, and the inflation gap have the same, same weight. And if you could also take lambda equal zero, then of course you would be only concerned about uh, inflation. So but the macroeconomic loss function is an important concept uh, for macroeconomic policy, especially for monetary policy, uh, where the central bank is, is focused with the question, how much uh, importance do I attach to the stabilization of the inflation rate? How much uh, importance do I attach to the stabilization of output? And we will, of course, discuss this also in much more detail. So um, alpha, well, alpha we don't need. So alpha we just can be, sorry. We have to believe that, yeah. So, and um, of course, uh, and then the output gap and inflation gap are spread uh, because it means positive and negative emissions have, to, have have the same value, and it also means that larger deviations get a higher importance than small uh, deviations. And what is quite nice, if you if you show this um, loss function graphically. Um, and you assume that lambda is one, then you can present it as circles. Um, it's kind of targets for, for marketing policy where you hear the, the bliss point where you have 2% inflation out of the cap zero and the larger the circles, the larger are the economic losses. Okay, so far um, for today, I, I'm aware of the fact that it's a lot of information, maybe it's too much information for you but um, we'll have the tutorials on Monday uh, where Lisa and Thomas will help you with all the questions that you have. Um, if you have direct questions right now, please feel free uh, to ask. If you also have suggestions um, so far, um, please be open for, for anything that you would like to state, please. Yeah, so the first question we got was regarding the measurement of inflation. Uh, what do you think about uh, the way to measure inflation as the relation of money growth in relation to GDP growth? Would that be a good measure of inflation, money growth to GDP growth? Well, I think inflation, of course, is measured directly. Directly, because uh, the statistical offices, they try to find out what are, what are private households consuming. So they make all kinds of surveys and ask how many eggs, how many haircuts, how many I don't know, uh, are you consuming? So they, for a typical household, they, um, they identify a basket of goods and services. And then uh, the people from the statistical office go, um, uh, go out to the stores, to the, uh, to, the, to, the, to the barber shops and wherever, and ask what are the prices? for these products. And so month to month, they try to find out what do all the individual items on the uh, baskets of consumer basket cost. And this way they calculate, they calculate uh, that, uh, the, uh, the price index. And of course, from this, you can find out the inflation rate. It's always important to note that this price index is of course an average uh, price index based on the consumption patterns of the average household. Uh, and uh, therefore, if some people say, well, I have the feeling that this uh, price index is flawed. Um, if I go uh, out, and it was before COVID, and drink beer in a pub or in a bar, 
I have the feeling the price of beer is increasing much more than inflation rate. Yes, of course, this can be the case, uh, if, especially the more beers you drink relative to the average uh, household, the more, of course, your consumption pattern diverges from the consumption pattern of the average household. Uh, and, and I think this is something one has to have in mind, that uh, inflation can only measure um, average consumption patterns. And now the question to the money growth and real growth, um, we will talk about this uh, in more detail. Um, the idea that, that if money, money stock grows stronger than, than the real growth, that this leads to inflation, uh, assumes that money is only held for purchasing goods and services. I think that's the key assumption of this approach. And I was talking about how theories shape our thinking. And, and even if you are not really aware of these theories and what the, the, the relationship that you address, the relationship between monetary growth and real growth is a key concept of the monetarist um, uh, theory um, and, and the so-called quantity theory of money. Um, and um, But it only holds under this very specific assumption that money is, is, is only used as for, for transaction and is not used as a stock fund. And I think what we observe right now is we have strong increase in money stocks, but many people just hold it as a stock value and uh, do not spend it. More questions? There's also a related question. Why are asset prices not included in this definition? Yeah, this is due to the fact that the idea is to, to uh, reflect uh, the cost of consumption for households and asset prices, uh, as long as you do not consume assets, <laughs> uh, then um, it's, it's not, it cannot be included. There are some proposals, people say, okay, uh, we have to in, uh, introduce the prices of, um, of ownership, of, of, of uh, partners uh, that, are, that people uh, hold, uh, that are owned by, by people um, and, and not to have the, the price, the, the rents in, in, the, in the consumer price index. So far, the consumer price index, we have just the rents, but not the, so to say, the implicit rent if you own it, if you live in your own apartment. Um, but again, this is also not so obvious because if somebody, someone has bought an apartment, let's say in Berlin five years ago, uh, the increase the value of this apartment was so huge that de facto he, has, he didn't pay anything for the rent, he even made a profit. Uh, and how can he include it, this in the price index? Uh, it was just living for free in this apartment. So I think it's really better to have the rental price of, of apartments and not, not to try to, to introduce the, the price of the apartment itself because that also very much depends on the affordability. So, also the prices of apartments have gone up quite a lot. At the same time, the interest rates have gone down a lot. So the affordability of, of apartments uh, has, has improved in, and has, uh, in the last, let's see, five or, five or 10 years. So we got an additional uh, question on inflation or the inflation rate. Um, how can it be that the inflation rate is falling at the moment when there's clearly a crisis going on and money would be really welcome in the economy? Why is the ECB so hesitant in comparison to the Fed? Well, it's, I would say, first of all, the ECB is not so less hesitant than the Fed right now. I think the difference is not so much the ECB, it's, it's the, the government's fiscal policy. Now, the main difference between the United States and the Euro area is that US fiscal policy is much more um, uh, expansionary than, than in the Euro area. So I think it started with Trump already and Biden even more. So the, the, the impact of this policy is, is about twice the impact uh, uh, of fiscal policy in the euro area. So the main difference is, is definitely fiscal policy. Uh, I think the central banks, the ECB and the Fed, they both more or less financed all the fiscal deficit. Uh, but the ECB cannot do more uh, than, than just finance all the deficits uh, of the governments, that's what they did. They even find a little bit more. But there was another, was it inflation or was it? 
No, I think that, that was the okay. question. Yeah. Uh, another question is, how is the output gap estimated based on trend GDP? Yes, more or less, there are different ways to, to measure it, um, but the typical method is uh, that, that, you, that you try to uh, identify the medium term trend of, of GDP and then try to uh, estimate the differences of the actual GDP from trend GDP. And of course, that also makes clear the, one of the difficulties of measuring output gaps because the trend GDP is also not, not so clear, especially if you have a very severe crisis as we are explaining it now. Uh, the question is how will be the overall trend of, of GDP once the pandemic is over? Uh, so will it just, be, we just go back uh, to, to what we had before the crisis? Or uh, will we see lower uh, economic growth because many service sectors, maybe the demand will never be, become as strong as it was before the crisis. And so this is, this is the main problem of this, of this output gap measurement that especially if you have major crisis, it's not so clear what, how, will it, how will it continue? Uh, and of course it would be easy to calculate it to say, okay, the, we have this crisis and after the crisis, we will continue with the same trend Then it's easy. Yeah, but if the crisis itself has an impact on the trend, then it's getting more difficult. So and one more question uh, regarding the inflation rate. Um, people are saving currently um, due to the pandemic. Um, and if they start spending again, and if they start spending all the saving they are uh, collected, um, isn't it likely that we come to inflation? And also if people get older and retire, they are likely to spend all their money. Well, let me start with the people that are older and retire, um, because I'm in this, in, this, in this range. So I think most people, when they retire, have less uh, regular income than they had before, uh, because then when you get uh, a pension, uh, it's, it's normally not 100% of your previous income. You need your savings somehow to keep up uh, your your uh, your. Um, uh, to keep your spending on, on the more or less the same level uh, than, than it was before retirement. So I think people who retire normally they do not have too much too much to spend. So they're somehow trying to keep up uh, with the standard of living that they had before. Um, of course, it's true we have we see a very strong increase in the saving rate in the United States, also in the euro area, because people, of course, did not have the opportunity to spend all their money. You could not go on vacation, the stores are closed, you can't go to restaurants. And the question is what will happen once the pandemic is over? Um, and I can imagine, yes, that we'll see stronger some price increases, let's say restaurants um, in, in, in hotels or so. But uh, I would say this, the share of these, of these prices on the, on the consumer price index is about 5%. So uh, that's probably not so much. Um, uh, the impact will be relatively limited. And um, as far as the, the, the straws are concerned, I think a lot of them have, uh, uh, have still relatively high stocks of, 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 of goods that, that they could not, could not sell. So I think they have to be very elastic in providing, providing an additional supply of products. And so there might be some short-term effects on, on inflation, but what matters, and this will be also <laughs> discussed in more detail in the next few weeks, um, key determinant of inflation is the situation on the labor market. Uh, and, and my, because wages are the um, main driver of, of inflation, and my uh, assessment, my guess is that after the pandemic is, is over, we'll have problems on the labor market in some service sectors of the economy, especially for low skilled people. Uh, working in, in in restaurants in hotels, um, they they will will lose their jobs because I'm relatively uh, convinced that after the pandemic we will not have the same level of of travel of business travel uh, that that we had before the pandemic. And so in these areas, people will lose their jobs. Uh, we'll have some unemployment, and uh, this will have a dampening effect on wages. And so. From, from the wage sector side, I don't expect any, any inflationary effects. And also energy prices, so in the, in the past, in the 1970s or 80s, 
uh, we had inflation due to very strong increase in oil prices, oil price shocks, it was called. But here also, I don't see that, that uh, energy prices uh, will, will have a secular uh, increase because we have this process of decarbonization and we will have less travel and, and less commuting in the post-COVID uh, period. So also from this side, I do not see any uh, effects on inflation. Finished? Finished. Okay, maybe we can, but we can do this in between. Maybe you can send, can have some kind of survey uh, among the students, how they found it, what they, what they could do different. But I think we do this. Uh, uh, on, we will send, send the surveys to students and then we can discuss the next week. Okay, how many students are still left? Still got uh, 80 students. Hey students, great, quite a lot. So thank you very much for attending. It's, it's a pleasure to have you and uh, also uh, want to thank you for your contributions, for your participation. That's really, really uh, helpful and needed to, to get some kind of discourse. Uh, thank you also for the, for the questions which are not directly maybe related to um, what, what I was teaching. And so thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye-bye.